Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History SAS session with Craig Tower, who will present on soccer in the Great Lakes region. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can find us best at our website at ussoccerhistory.org and on social media with our Facebook and Twitter accounts. If you'd like to join the society or renew your membership, please visit our website um, and uh, do so. There's a join SASH tab. Quick uh, announcement, good news announcement. Uh, James Brown, our uh, loyal uh, and dedicated vice president of SASH, uh, received his author copies today of uh, the book that uh, he wrote about his family's sporting history. Uh, there's information uh, about that on the website, but uh, that is a great moment for uh, any author uh, to get your author copies. So congratulations uh, to James. Now on to uh, today's speaker. Craig Tower is a longtime follower of the game who grew up, grew up outside Cleveland, Ohio, playing on West Side youth teams. During college, he majored in history and played soccer at Haverford. During his college years, he traveled to Italy for the 1990 World Cup, the first for the US since 1950. Craig also served in the Peace Corps so I believe he is officially the first uh, Peace Corps alumnus uh, to give a SASH presentation. Uh, so that is a, a nice trivia uh, note. Dr. Tower then received a PhD in cultural anthropology from Northwestern University for research on mass communication in Africa. He had spent two years in Mali uh, with the Peace Corps. He began researching US soccer history in 2010 with the Open Cup website know that one quite well. If you don't, you should definitely visit it at thecup.us. He has an interest in soccer in the early 20th century in the central and eastern Great Lakes region. And that's what he'll talk about today. So please, a warm welcome to Craig Tower. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Tom. And uh, I'm going to thank Ed also for helping to organize and SASH, of course, um, as an organization. I haven't been as involved uh, with SASH as I'd like, but uh, I did get to a meeting in Baltimore and I wanna you know, be more involved. Um, it's also an honor to be on with some people uh, whose work I'm very familiar with. Um, Gabe Logan, for one, I would mention. Um, I'm gonna mention some of his work as I go through. Uh, and um, you know, I have to say Peter Wilt, to be on the phone with Peter Wilt is an honor. As a Chicago Fire fan, so take, take from that what you will, but you know, I'm laying it out there. I'm trying to be honest. Um, so I wanna talk uh, today, I don't have a formal presentation. Um, I did mention I've got one picture I wanna show, but I'm gonna talk through um, how I began and developed the research um, that I'm gonna discuss. I'm gonna talk, and this is about um, inner city games, inner city competition leading up to um, an inner city league that formed in 1929 to 1930 um, in three cities in the Midwest. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how I developed that research. I'm gonna talk about the sort of inner city game patterns before that league formed and leading up to it. Then I'm gonna talk about um, why, why the league formed given the fact that there, were, there was all this um, activity and people desired a league, but they never, they, couldn't really form one until the inner city league um, emerged in 29. Then I'm gonna describe the league a little bit. And finally, I'm gonna talk about what caused the demise of the league and try to address a little bit um, the legacy of the league such as it is. Um, so that's what I'm gonna, that's how I'm gonna move through things. And I'm gonna try not to take too long with my comments, but. So I began research in Cleveland soccer because I was really interested in how far back the game went. Um, this is before Tom Hatfield put out his self-published book that some of you may be familiar with on the history of soccer in Cleveland. Um, I was surprised to find games in the 1890s that seemed to be very uh, far back um, from what I had imagined. You know, I think that's a typical pattern. Um, we're learning more and more about the history of soccer in the U.S. and we discover there's a deeper, deeper history than people realize. Um, in fact, Tom Hatfield doesn't mention that stuff in his book. He only starts in like 1904. 
1906 when the league was formed. So I started to focus on games in Cleveland. Um, the formation of the Cleveland League followed the, following the Corinthians tour in 1906. Um, and I discovered there was an inner city game for a Cleveland team in Bay City, Michigan in 1890, which was, you know, a, to me, it was a little bit surprising um, that they were, you know, going to Michigan to play. Um, the newspapers in Cleveland, I'm not gonna go through the entire history of that. I'm just gonna say that um, from my history on newspapers, on, on teams in, in Cleveland, there was this intermittent interest that pop, would pop up in inner city play would actually be more of a constant interest, but it only developed, you know, every few years. Um, and there was talk about forming a league, um, but it's really seemed like a pipe dream when, you know, if you looked at the local leagues, they were sort of uh, very malleable in terms of the, the constitution of the leagues with teams coming and going, et cetera. I think everyone's familiar with that pattern. And it seemed to me very analogous to, you know, the articles we'd, I'd see every four or five years in the, in the papers about how soccer was going to overcome football and become, and, and baseball in popularity. In other words, it seemed like a pipe dream. Inner city league, that's going to happen just about as soon as soccer becomes more popular than, than baseball. So um, I found out from the, uh, one of the Vangeren books, and of course from later on uh, Gabe Logan's dissertation about the inner city league, but there really was just not very much on it. I think it was one line in, in the Van Gren book. Um, so I began researching it and it was, you know, I had never heard of it before, um, but it was, you know, evident from the start that it was a professional league. Um, even though it's a very modest thing, there's three cities, two teams in each city, and it really only lasted one year. Now, it seems like an afterthought in the histories of each of the cities individually, because the local leagues continued um, more or less uh, during the period of the, the inner city league and after. So, you know, what really made it interesting to me was that it got me thinking about the um, inner city games before, and it really showed this, they really show this constant desire to extend, expand beyond play in individual cities. This really strong desire to compete and connect. And ultimately for me, I mean, I mentioned I'm an anthropologist, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna throw any theory out there, but it, it gives us an image of what kinds of communities formed around the game, especially in places that haven't really been the subject of a lot of research. So we don't really know, uh, you know, that much about, you know, out in the, that's, that's been, you know, published in sorts. Um, it also just, you know, helps us understand what kind of cooperation and resources were needed to make that kind of inner city um, competition possible. Um, and I want to mention one thing about geography before I go on. I, meant, I talk about the Great Lakes. Sometimes I talk about the Midwest. This is something I went back and forth with Tom and Ed on. Oh, the Midwest, the Great Lakes, these are very malleable uh, areas. They're sort of in the difficult to define. I started using that term because the competitions, the inner city games that teams were seeking were sort of circumscribed by roughly the, the Great Lakes. So, you know, teams in Akron were going to wanting to play, you know, teams in Cleveland, of course, but also in Pittsburgh and then over to Chicago. You know, everyone wanted to play Chicago. Teams didn't want to play St. Louis, so it's not strictly um, within the Great Lakes, but most of the competition tended to be, you know, around the Great Lakes area. Not a lot of interest in saying, we want to, we got to get out there and play New York or DC or Boston. It, um, so it was the Great Lakes area, including Toronto, I must add. Um, so I can go more down a rabbit hole about the Midwest and Great Lakes if anyone wants to talk about that, but for now, that's it. So I wanted to say a little bit more about the, the patterns of the inner city games that I've seen before the inner city league formed in 1929. Most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about is pre-World pre War I. Um, as I said, teams were seeking competition regionally. The larger cities tended to seek games, you know, with Chicago, St. Louis, Toronto. Um, it was a range bounded roughly by Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and Indiana Indianapolis, and I guess Chicago on the on the on the outside. 
Um, I haven't done a lot of work more towards the West. Obviously, Milwaukee, um, Madison are there, and there's you know lots to explore there. But um, those are the boundaries I'm roughly talking about. The interesting thing is when I started to find games that teams were playing, um, you know, smaller cities, they were also seeking inner city games. In other words, there were smaller cities, teams in smaller cities that were very interested in, in um, inner city competition. They couldn't always get competition with, you know, the big cities, though they might like to. Um, so I'm talking about places like Muncie, Indiana, East Liverpool, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio. They had very active um, teams and leagues. Well, yeah, teams and leagues for, for all of those uh, going back into the 1890s, um, which, you know, until I really started delving into newspapers.com, you know, there were mentions in Cleveland papers of, oh, there's a team in East Liverpool, Ohio. So there's signs, you know, every, you know, once every 10 years, there's a team there. So it's very exciting to discover that these things, these competitions really were existing. Um, I want to highlight one in particular, just because I find it very interesting. Um, there was a really active competition between the Sh Cincinnati Shamrocks and the Muncie Union. So the, this is in the mid to late 18, 1890s, although competition continued after that. Um, there were attendances uh, for these games, which would happen about two to three times a year. Um, you know, they were really sort of ad hoc matchups. Attendances were up to 1,500 to 2,500 fans for some matches and reports of up to 200 traveling supporters for some games. So within a, you know, within a certain community, this is, could be a very exciting thing. Um, in 1896, Muncie was uh, disgruntled about the um, refereeing that they had um, experienced in Cincinnati and they offered to play Cincinnati for between $100 and $500 a side on a neutral ground, around $3,500 to $17,000. And the response of the Cincinnati team was, well, we're, we're amateurs. We didn't realize you're professionals. So that they started to move into an area where they started to think of themselves as more than just amateur local teams, that they were really the, the, you know, a big thing. And they started to talk about um, being champions of the state, champions of the tri-state area, even mentions of being national champions, though no one was competing against East Coast teams. So don't ask me about, you know, how they kind of came to that conclusion. Um, the competing, there were competing newspaper articles in, in, in the local papers. And there was a lot of what I would have to talk, tra talk about, describe as trash talk between the two sides in their local outlets which was really, um, really interesting to see. Um, in fact, so I'm gonna give you a little quote. After the Union tied and defeated the Shamrocks in 1896, this was around the time when they had received the challenge for the $500 um, competition. Um, an article appeared in the Muncie Times that stated, quote, the unions are ready and willing to play the Shamrocks and can beat them any day in the week. The unions have money too and are not afraid to put it up. So that's, that's an example. It's maybe a milder example. There's all kinds of imputations about people being, you know, ruffians and um, to use a term that I consider now, you know, having the hospitality of digger Indians and so forth. But clearly the teams were passionate um, and these competitions lasted, you know, over several years. And um, I think that they, when the Challenge Cup came along, it satisfied some of the, um, the interest in inner city games for uh, the local leagues. But alongside this, there were pushes for inner city leagues that you'd see come up every few years in the newspapers. Um, a few, I'm sure there are people who are familiar with some of these, 1893, 1896, 1900, 1901, 1906. In fact, in 1901, there was a league that was documented by um, Gabe Logan that was almost formed with teams in Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, and St. Louis. And one of the things that's significant about this, is even before the league formed, um, and one of the reasons for it demise, its demise was the cost of rail travel. So the distance is that the, the teams, the organizers recognized that, you know, the distance between St. Louis and Detroit, 600 miles. 
So you compare that to you know the East Coast, um, Boston to Philly, that's half the distance you know to Boston from Boston to Philly, and even a third of the distance from you know um, uh, uh, Boston to um, Boston. Excuse me, I'm getting my numbers confused. I'm not going to. Detroit and Milwaukee run 400 miles. In other words, there are great distances that teams were traveling. So that was a challenge um, for ad hoc games, but certainly a challenge um, when teams really considered forming a league. And it's one of the reasons that um, that 1901 league really, really never got off the off the ground, among among other things. Um, another problem that uh, was revealed um, in doing this research was getting the agreements of the state associations to form leagues across cities. The, the state associations were, um, did not wanna see their best teams disappear from local competition. Um, there's not a lot I could find about, about their opposition to these, but as the inner city, the, the inner city league in 2930 was forming, there was some mention of some of the opposition that state associations had um, before this, and there was an intimation that that really blocked um, some of the efforts prior. That that they, you know, there were not the same kind of challenges that they had with the Challenge Cup as sort of a one-off, centrally organized competition from the USFA. That um, that state opposition, state uh, associations, really couldn't oppose. So, given some of the challenges. Um, you know, the question I sort of asked myself was why did the Midwest um, League even begin in 1929? Well, I think everyone's familiar that there was the soccer wars uh, were going on, maybe wrapping up on the East Coast with the rogue ASL battling the USFA, you know, issues about um, transfer fees for Scottish players, the, um, the other league that formed with the USFA's um, support. So um, that was clearly, you know, a lot of effort was being put into that by, by the USFA and the other parties involved. The 1921 USFA meeting was in Cleveland. Um, and on June 15th, the backers of this new Midwest League to be called the Midwest Soccer League applied to the National Council of USFA for affiliation as a pro league. I think the timing was really key here because at this, at this meeting, four out of five of the executive officers of the USFA were Midwesterners from Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, and Chicago. Um, and originally those were the same cities that were originally proposed for the Midwest League. St. Louis did not um, continue in their, in their interest for reasons that I'm, I don't actually, I'm not actually certain why they, they didn't, I can intimate, but I'm not gonna guess. Um, so I think the USFA was eager to foster the game in the middle of the country. Maybe they were seeking a counterbalance um, to what was going on on the East Coast and the, and the ASL, um, hoping to get another you know, power base in the Midwest. Um, it could probably help the USFA by contrib contributing to, the, to their coffers um, in another way. You know, having an additional professional league would, would bring in more money. Um, I think it probably would help the USFA, their standing in the eyes of the overseas FAs and FIFA, if they could have another league that was, you know, not flaunting FIFA's rules and not flaunting the transfer fees that uh, were demanded from foreign teams. Um, on the state level, uh, the, this was, the support of the USFA was very important because it allowed the league to bypass the three respective state associations. And they got an approval that, um, that gave them basically monopoly rights to professional teams in their area. So the agreement, according to the paper, the, I believe this is the uh, uh, Detroit, um, Detroit Free Press, the agreement quote, would preclude any club operating professionally within the prescribed territorial limits of each of the cities named. So outside of the two professional teams, no, pro, no other professional teams um, were allowed. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what the league was like uh, after it was formed. Um, I'm not gonna describe too much more about, about how it was formed. Um, 
just for the interest of time. There were different types of teams in the league. I think these, these types will be familiar to people, um, especially we're familiar with teams uh, you know, in the Midwest, certainly in Chicago at the time. There were ethnic teams like Chicago Sparta, Cleveland Slavia, and Cleveland Rules, which was uh, formed out of a, it was basically the, the American Hungarians renamed and sponsored by an insurance company. There were labor teams like the Carpenters in Chicago, which used to be Canadian Club. Um, and there was a company team, Holly Carburetor in Detroit, which uh, was formed out of another, another uh, prominent club, um, ended up collapsing after the 29-30 season, which I'll mention a bit more um, later on why they collapsed. <laughs> and there was an independent team called Detroit FC, which was founded by the former owner of Wood Hydraulic in Detroit. So it was, again, coming out of the roots of an industrial team. Um, they had a strong connection to Scottish soccer and um, especially uh, Scots coming through Canada, I would note. Um, in terms of where the players came from, even though there were ethnic teams, um, they were not, they were not, these teams I, were not really organized uh, on the field along ethnic lines. You know, the best players, the teams are getting players from the best players wherever they could. The, um, some of the best players were uh, Wilson for the Brules. He was an English player. He was XASL. Emery for um, Detroit, a Scottish player. And Greenlees was a homegrown Carpenters player uh, from Chicago. Um, Michael Bookie, of course, was XASL, and he was from Pittsburgh. So you'd see patterns where, you know, like Cleveland teams would often draw from Pittsburgh, um, a little bit from Chicago, local teams. They would pull players up from Akron. Uh, teams in Detroit often drew, often looked to uh, Toronto for their players. Um, in fact, there was a whole wave of players that started to play for Detroit FC that um, were deemed a failure after about a month. They were supposed to be the hot, great thing from the top. Toronto teams and um, they didn't work out so well. Um, Sparta and Slavia drew a lot of teams from the local Chicago area um, and some from Czechoslovakia. They were also not um, beyond uh, getting players from, um, from Toronto. And there are also many players drawn from, from ASL, not huge quantities, but each team would, you know, uh, would garner a couple players from the ASL. So they were, ASL players were open to, you know, earning their paycheck elsewhere. Um, no records that I could find exist of any players being recruited from St. Louis. And I thought that was very interesting. So it either says something about the strength and the uh, pay that players would get uh, from St. Louis, or maybe there was some reasons why teams thought that they wouldn't be able to recruit them. Um, I haven't found anything beyond the fact that there's that absence. So maybe others could, uh, you know, as we're talking, I, you can give me ideas about that. I want to talk a little bit about the season. It was split into two. The first half was a regular table, <coughs> uh, table formation. Um, the second half was called the Triner Cup. It was a double elimination term, and excuse me, one by the rules. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. The, the, the season was very competitive as it as it went through. Um, no team was like the whipping boy. There was no team that was the undisputed champion the whole time. T, they're, they're the upper, the um, team sort of waxed and waned as their as their uh, players came and went. And they were very flexible, very um, sort of malleable throughout. There was a lot of testing of, of different players over the season, not a lot of stability. Um, the Brewers did play in the Challenge Cup final against Fall River. Um, they got trounced in the first leg seven to two, and then they uh, also you know, didn't come through in the, in the second league. So they, they didn't succeed in the, in the Challenge Cup, but they did beat ASL teams on their way to the uh, to the championship, which I think is um, is significant. Um, as I mentioned, you know the league only lasted for one year. the The demise is the reasons for the demise of the league are not crystal clear. Um, I think the financial crash of 1929 
must have had an impact. Detroit and Cleveland in particular were automotive hubs. And those are one of the first industries to get hit hard by the depression because autos um, were still a luxury. Um, so as auto sales plummeted, um, you know, the, the, the disposable income that people had to, to see uh, games, I'm sure, uh, diminished. And the owners probably um, saw the writing on the wall too. That, that is um, an inference on my part. I'm not gonna say that I saw anything that pointed directly to the depression as being the, the source of the demise. More interestingly, there was a scandal around Holly Carburetor. Um, when they were playing the final of the Triner Cup against um, the Cleveland Rules, they delayed, uh, they delayed the game to allow a game of the Labor Sport Union League to be finished. And this is something, again, that uh, I'll defer to Gabe Logan for any description of the Labor Sport Union. Um, but the USFA president, uh, Patterson, who was from Detroit, argued that the LSA, LSU League had no allegiance to the UFS, USFA, excuse me, and that the, you couldn't tell if the players were professional or amateur. And for that reason, they shouldn't have been on that field at all before, um, before the final of the Triner Cup. Of course, he also, you know, there was also a lot of talk about Bolshevism and, you know, Red Menace and, and things like this. But the upshot was that the, um, the Holly team was suspended along with their manager, George Visser. And in the words of, um, of Arthur Sale, the preeminent uh, Detroit um, soccer writer at the time, uh, this climax to a generally unsatisfactory league season has probably sounded the death knell of the inner city professional circuit, which has not been a paying proposition since its inception. So on that last note, the paying proposition, I, I was desperate to find more information on what kind of financial viability were the teams finding. And really, you know, most of the coverage focused on, you know, focused on play on the field, what players were coming and going, really the sporting aspects. There wasn't a lot besides some of these hints that were dropped by people like, mainly by Arthur Sale, about the, you know, behind the scenes actions with the league. Um, but I'm sure that was also something along with, you know, the other things I've mentioned that were reasons for the demise of the league. I do want to mention this, the, the strength of the league at the time for the, the brief um, time that it existed. The 1930 USMNT team that went to um, the World Cup had four players from Midwest. Two of them were from the Midwest League. One was Alexander Wood, and one was Michael Bookie. And I want to mention, this is where I'm going to show you my screen, because I think it's very important. I have one debt to history that I need to um, dispense with. Okay, I'm getting information about showing notifications on my screen and so forth. You are now the host, Craig, so you can. Okay, here we up. go. I hope you see my screen. Do you see uh, an article, a newspaper article? Okay. Michael Bookie, I think everyone, many people will be familiar with him from the 1930 World Cup. Um, he was adamant, his name was Michael, not Mike. So I'm appealing to you. All of you as soccer historians, let's set the record straight. Let's stop calling him Mike, please. Um, he was one of the most prominent players on the, on the, on the, uh, in, from this league. Um, and he played in Cleveland for many, many years, even beyond um, the um, demise of the US Inner City League. So I just wanted to um, share that with you. Um, one Midwest player was on the, well, that's not important. There were three players um, on the league, from the league, uh, um, Ralph Carafi, Buff Dinelli, and Michael Bookie, who are in the US Soccer Hall of Fame, as well as Joseph Triner, who was the, um, uh, the commissioner of the league and founder. One player, Art Hollowell, is in the Canadian Soccer Hall of Fame, and at least four played on Toronto or Ontario uh, select or all-star sides. So in addition to having a team, two teams go to the um, 
semifinals of the U.S. Challenge Cup that year, you know, there were some prominent players that that were playing in the league. And so um, I think that's worth worth noting in terms of um, both the general strength of teams in the Midwest leading up to this um, league, as well as the um, the efforts that they made to to bring in players to put competitive teams on the field. So the legacy is, um, you know, looking at it, you know, the league disappeared, though in Chicago, it's not as clear that the league just disappeared completely. And I think, um, again, Gabe Logan uh, knows more about what happened in Chicago locally with the, the teams that were in that league and the formation there. Um, but the, the pros did definitely did not kill soccer locally in spite of fears to the contrary by some of the state associations. And um, the soccer communities that allowed the formation of the league in the first place did continue. There were strong leagues, um, definitely in Chicago, but also in Detroit and Cleveland, you know, multi-level uh, leagues that continued into the 1930s. So um, it shows, I think, that the league, though it lasted for only one year, was not, you know, it was not really the fly by night that it might appear um, from some of the references in history that we, we've seen to it. Um, and I'm going to be, you know, this is a work in project progress. I'm very interested in anything else someone can throw at me, either in you know, corrections or um, additions um, in terms of places to look and things I should think about. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention. And thanks for your patience with my just jabbering at you without great visuals. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Craig. And I'm, I'm going to open up. Uh, the floor, uh, I see a hand, uh, Kevin Talek Marston with uh, the first question. Go ahead, or comment, or both. Thanks, Tom. Actually, I was just applauding. It wasn't a hand, but um, <laughs> I do have questions, but I don't want to be first. I'm always, I'm always first, so. Now, break the ice for us. Go um, ahead. All right. um, thank you so much, Craig. That was, that was really interesting. Um, there are a lot of things I would love to pick up on there um, in terms of, of different themes that you picked up. The problem of geography, um, I thought was really interesting how you how you worked that in. It really seems that that up until, you know, through the whole first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, the geograph geographic problem is key wherever things are developing. Yeah. And for whatever reason, and and you know, this is, it's an open question. I don't have an answer to it. I'm just wondering about it. I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how is it um, that the, you know, baseball figures out how to manage geography. Mm -hmm. They can still do professionalism across geography and it succeeds. Um, and they're using the same tools and techniques. They use monopoly. You talked about the monopoly, the territorial exclusivity that, you know, teams are saying, okay, not in this, you know, outside of our city, we can only have one club, all of this. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, is it just a question of critical mass? Because, you know, baseball, they've got critical mass with spectators buying tickets, you know, because that's, that's the big funding and they've got corporate backers of big um, in industry. Um, and I just wonder if it's a question of scale in, in the, you know, in the Great Lakes region and all of that. Is it just that, you know, the people who are investing and, and, and trying to run professionalism, is it that, that, there just isn't, you know, that they're they're not enough to break even, and therefore it just continuously fails. It's kind of my 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 first. I had a question on St. Louis as well, um, but I'll save that for later. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I, I I you know I didn't mention baseball, and you know, obviously that's sort of the not the gorilla in the room, but whenever you're trying to make these comparisons and think about, you know, why why did soccer form in the way it is, did it did. And, why, despite the desires that did not reach the level of, you know, baseball. Um, one reason this is this whole, the league interests me, and I didn't mention this, but, you know, at the time, Detroit, Cleveland, and Chicago were three of the six biggest cities in the U.S. So in terms of, you know, population, so the overall population is there, right? These are not tiny cities who, you know, were overstretching themselves in terms of, but the fan base clearly, you know, I think just, just unfortunately wasn't there is what I would have to infer. Regrettably, <laughs> as much as I want to look back in history and find, find success instead of like, uh, you know, frustration I get in reading Vangren and the continual, you know, repeated failures of soccer in the U.S. Um, but I think you're pointing at something there with, 
with that. I don't have a great answer, but um, it is uh, definitely food for thought. And I agree that it's not something, it's not limited to the Midwest, but I found noted um, instances where people point to geography as the reason for uh, failure, you know, failure of leagues or inability to start them. Thanks for that question and comment. I see Peter Wilt's hand. Peter. Uh, great topic, great conversation, Craig. Um, and yeah, fire all the way. Um, <laughs> and, and interesting comments about baseball. I was on a, a Sabre call a couple of days ago about the Union League, 1884 league, which failed after a season. And they attributed their failure they had 10 reasons, but one of them was the reserve clause. They actually went opposite of uh, the National League, and I think it was the American Association, and got rid of the reserve clause. And that's part of why they only one year. But I think the critical mass of baseball teams is, is indeed part of it. Um, I, I have two questions, if I can. Um, uh, one is about the ownership structure. Was it, um, mm. were there different types of team owners, club owners? Was it community owned? Was it a, a major local industry sponsor of it? And then the other question is about, um, and Chuck Carlson is an expert on this, but the small, the small community clubs in central Illinois in the coal fields, um, mm. was that somewhat common and replicated throughout the Great Lakes or was that unique in that you had, you know, dozens of small community clubs in towns with 2000 population? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the first, the second uh, topic first. Um, I think Muncie is a good example of that. I mean, Muncie is a little bit larger than a 2000 person town but I think you do find that pattern in some places. Um, I didn't talk a lot about some of these, some of these inner city games that, that I've seen. And in some cases, it's really hard to find out more about these tiny teams because there's really just no local paper that mentions them. It's when they play a, a Cincinnati or when they play uh, you know, Youngstown or something that you, you hear about them. Um, I would say that phenomenon was more pronounced in, um, uh, in eastern, the Eastern Ohio, Western PA, with, like I said, um, East Liverpool, which was a big potter, it was a pottery um, center, pottery industry was huge there. Youngstown, some of the teams adjacent to Youngstown, like uh, Boardman, uh, had teams. Um, and those were, you know, based around the, and of course, into, into PA, um, the coal towns that, that had uh, teams sort of going down into, into Pittsburgh. Um, I think, you know, those teams, a lot of those teams were attracted more to, um, to Pittsburgh leagues, but, uh, there's definitely, you know, teams that are sort of geographically not on an Island, but they couldn't really form a viable local league, like between East Liverpool and Youngstown. They never really it's always tried, never really could, you know, form a Mahoning Valley league. They tried, but it just, some of the distances were too far. East Liverpool was kind of betwixt and between. Some of the cities. So I think there is a pattern there. I think there's much more to do in, in finding out how common it was, to be honest. I can also um, say that um, the distance, uh, the travel distance issue has not gone away, even in the jet age. Uh, being involved in lower division soccer in the Midwest Premier League, <laughs> it's still an issue. <laughs> no one's saying this is, is pure history. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Um, as to ownership, honestly, I just, you know, because of the focus of the sports writers, um, there I know much less about that. You know, I know that, like I said, the Cleveland Brewers emerged from the American Hungarians. Um, I think they were still it was sponsored by the Brewers. I'm not sure how much you know of the administration was conducted by the American Hungarian soccer uh, organization. How much was sort of you know directed or decreed by um, uh, uh, the Brule institution, Slavia was definitely, you know, 
based on an in an ethnic club, but I'm not sure who put up you know the majority money for it. I don't know. Don't know we don't have enough information about the, um, the 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 clubs and the communities they emerged out of as to ownership. Um, that that I'd say that goes also to Detroit. I think we know much more about Sparta uh, from from some of the work that Gabe has done, and um, probably the Carpenters as well. And I think that Gabe can really address <laughs> address that side of things much better than I can because I I know he knows the depth of history there, whereas you know I, I know just a little bit. Well, and, uh, and I'll chime in. I can say that. Um, Last year, Detroit City traveled to Chicago by Amtrak, uh, which was a wonderful example. I wish more teams would do it. I think actually an team may have done it last weekend, going from maybe it was the Commanders going to New York or something like that. But uh, train travel should come back. I agree with you on that. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to add a, I'll add a comment and then then a question that I think are linked. I mean, Bob Gansler has the, the gold standard on source material, right? With uh, uh, his work in Milwaukee, right? He, you know, got access to the old timers and the minutes book first in German and then uh, transitioned to, to English. And, and these are the sources that were lacking, uh, especially from um, governing bodies and these ethnic clubs. So th the more of these types of things that maybe make their way out of a um, somebody's attic or, or basement or in, into our hands or or archival um, depositories, you know, the better. Some of these questions that that you're facing will, will potentially be answered. So my question is, you're. A lot of people here are, are doing their own research. Your research method. I, I heard you say newspapers.com, which is kind of the, the door that has opened uh, for a lot of us, right? I mean, this is not an insignificant uh, development. The digitization, uh, not only of just the big national dailies, but these local papers. So, you know, talk, uh, you know, a bit at, uh, you know, how you found this information. What was your research method? Yeah, thank you. That that this I started out looking in. Um, I got access to the Cleveland Plain Dealer digitally through uh, through my mother's <laughs> library account, which was a huge boon to me because um, it's not available. Cleveland Plain Dealer is not available very very many sources. You can't get it on newspaper.com. Um, and then yeah, again, uh, it's largely been through you know through online sources to be honest, um, and. You know, it started. I mentioned finding a mention, a mention finding a citation, a, a note about a game against an East Liverpool team in a Cleveland paper, Cleveland Plain Dealer, in 1896 or something. I never really thought very much about that, but then I'm in newspapers.com and I'm thinking, well, wonder if I can find more about that. So I, you know, a little search and you find, oh, my God, the East Liverpool paper is actually accessible, and so that opens up a whole nother well, the whole other side of the story that was, you know, was completely mute before, to me at least. And, you know, I, you know, I haven't been able to develop things as much as I'd like. I'm st still in the process, like I said. Um, you know, I know other people are working on all kinds of things too. I, I would cite the uh, Cincinnati Muncie competition as something that really opened up based on the newspaper sources because you can see both sides of this trash talking that I was talking about. You know, the teams referring to each other in the newspapers and getting to see, you know, the, the, the boosterism on the home on the home side. And it really, um, you know, opened things up. As far as other local sources, you know, I've gone into a little bit, um, some of the sources, I haven't, I didn't mention Akron, but big soccer community in Akron. Um, I think people are aware of the Goodyear and Goodrich teams that were prominent there in the 20s and 30s. There are some resources there, um, you know, through local uh, you know, Akron libraries and so forth that I've tried to look at. Um, some of those there are on site and I just haven't been able to get, get to those locations. But it's really kind of an iterative process that I was talking about, you know, finding games, 
trying to see, can I find more information about that game from another source, um, preferably in the, the, the other city. Um, with Muncie, it just opened up the whole idea that there's, there's soccer, you know, there was soccer in Muncie. That was like totally new to me that, that a city like Muncie would have that. Um, uh, that's probably not a really satisfying answer, but it's, it's you know, I, as, as an anthropologist, I'm very much trained to do iterative research where you discover one thing and you, you know, you don't know, you don't necessarily have a, a, a hypothesis to start with. I know it's, well, anyways, I'm not going to go on about that, but it seems very natural to me to just sort of explore and follow leads and, you know, continue on, right. which I know is familiar in history as well, yeah. but. I'm not trying right. to say. Uh, yeah, I think I, now it's solely it's solely to itself. But. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, we have two other hands raised. I think uh, Gabe first, and then Chuck, please. Hey, Craig, thanks for your research and, and your words. A uh, couple points. I'm I'm working on a paper for some years now on the Harley carburetors, and COVID shut down the Ford archives that house the carburetors industrial documents and there doesn't seem to be anything there on the soccer team um, and they're not in any hurry to open it up i think they're, they're going to try to run that library remotely but that's kind of what's been the hold up on it uh, that aside i wondered if you mentioned joseph triner and triner's involvement with the socos of sparta and the soco community and the athletic community of czech chicago and the Czech community in Cleveland. I'm wondering if you found any more. I think he's a real hidden story about soccer in the Midwest. And I know he had his athletic feet in the boxing world, in racing mm -hmm. and soccer. I mean, the dude was ubiquitous. <clears throat> I was wondering if you found any more about Triner. And then my second question, this league that came about in the the 1940s and 50s, the North American Professional Soccer League, which extends your research into the 50s, were there any connections to Cleveland and Detroit other than the teams, but some of these organizers that maybe put that together? So. Mm. No, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for the note about the Ford archives. Um, you know, I, uh, I'd be interested to hear if, uh, if, you, if you glean anything um, from there when you eventually get in. Um, the um, Triner, I have to admit, you know, I didn't find a lot uh, more detail about Triner um, besides, you know, I've used sources uh, from, you know, Chicago, really, the, you know, the Chicago papers and whatnot, um, and some of the um, notes from, um, you know, on his industrial background and, and so forth. So you've outlined basically, you know, what I know that he's got a long past with the, the, the community in Chicago. You know, there's uh, a mention that he wasn't interested in in soccer at all, and then he saw three games overseas. I can't remember. I don't I don't remember where he was. He said he saw two games and they were deathly boring, and the third game made him a permanent fan. Basically, was the quote. Uh, well, not a permanent fan. He didn't say permanent fan, but he said he goes to every game he can, which you know, I can I can. It was it was a nice note. It, it like made him come alive a little bit. But yeah, he was obviously, as you said, very much um, involved in Czech organizations. Very much involved in sports in general. Boxing was a big thing for him too, as well. You know, I'm sure more than I do about him. And unfortunately, I don't have like, anything to add. Yeah, no, I don't. I he's a bit of a mystery. Um, but I think he's really a glue that held a lot of this together. Definitely with this league. Yeah. 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 I'm off to delve back into my notes and see if there's stuff that I'm that I'm not remembering. Um, but I can happily, you know, share that. Um, and then the uh, the 40s and 50s, I don't haven't gone that far. I, I with my U um, Challenge Cup Open Cup research, I went back to the late 60s. I haven't really dealt with the 40s and 50s. I know that the one of the Cleveland teams was in the Challenge Cup final in 45, but um, Beyond that, I'm I, I'm not sure what structures were there. I know that there were certain players that stayed on. Um, uh, Gallagher um, Gallagher was one of them. He was a prom, very prominent um, player who played in uh, I think in Slavia uh, in the 30s. 
and he stayed on. He was had played in the USL and he stayed on in ASL, excuse me, and he stayed on into the 30s, 40s in Cleveland as a very prominent coach and administrator. But um, that's that's really all I know. So thank you. Hope, 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 hopeful, you know, love to hear more as you discover it. Likewise. Okay. Chuck, your turn. And I think Patrick Sullivan has a question after that. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Chuck, go ahead. Yes. Is it okay? Sorry, I'm at Riot Fest here, but I didn't want to miss this. Um, so thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Um, I have a question. What kind of political support or lack of support did uh, this league get? Um, I know Cermak was a big soccer fan. And so wondering if politicians in other cities were also interested. Um, and my second question is, did the foreign tours that had occurred, for example, Nacional of Uruguay and um, the earlier Pilgrims tours and Corinthians tour have any effect uh, on these this formation? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Uh, questions, I should say. Um, to the first one about the politics, that's that I um, would have difficulty answering that beyond you know the appearance of a mayor here or there to you know start a game. Um, what I can say is what I mentioned about um, the uh, labor sport union and the sort of general uh, reluctance to be too involved in, you know, labor activity and teams from, you know, that were involved in labor. Obviously, with the carpenters, that becomes very complicated, the industrial teams. Um, but I didn't find anything that specifically, you know, gave me any great information about, you know, involvement of other politicians, to be honest. Um, and as to the international tours, the, these, the, all these teams were definitely playing, you know, as many foreign teams as they could when they came through. Um, what I can speak to probably most directly to your question after the summer after, um, the league broke up the Cleveland Brules in part, I think, because they had been in the final of the US, uh, the Challenge Cup. They, they uh, played five or six foreign teams. And I think that was quite, probably quite a better moneymaker for them than the league itself. That may have had something to do with, um, you know, the decision not to continue on with the league formation. But I, again, Unfortunately, the, the information I've seen from the sports writers really focuses on the game on the field and not, not as much as I would like on you know, administration, financial, political aspects of things. But that's a great question. Yeah, the old mayor or local councilman uh, kicking off uh, you know, a game or a charity event. Uh, yeah, you always got to figure out if, it, if it's more than just that. Uh, well, Patrick. he didn't have the game shut down, you know, so there's that to, to be said, but, you know, beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> I see a question in the queue from Patrick, uh, if he's not able yeah. to. Hey, yeah, hey, Tom, I can, I can ask, I'll just reiterate what I put in the chat, but uh, thanks, Craig, and this might be, I guess, a general question to all the Midwesterners uh, on the presentation, but I was just, we were talking about geography and then just different sources or avenues of research and I was kind of curious what percentage of maybe passenger transport was handled by the interurban companies up in the Midwest because you had extensive interurban networking systems there as opposed to the railroads and I know that the interurbans at least in Atlanta and other parts of the south um, the streetcar companies were very much invested in purchasing or, or, or tied heavily to baseball teams because these were revenue generators and I didn't know if anybody stumbled across um, any information of these companies or these interurban companies maybe promoting uh, games or sponsoring teams historically or anything of that nature. Uh, the one thing I can say that, that most directly addresses that is 
when the Muncie teams were playing Cincinnati, and this is the 1890s, take, you know, so take that into this is not the 1930s or 2020s. Um, there was a, and I don't, you, you seem much more familiar with the structure of rail transport than I am, but there were definitely, you know, sponsored excursions from, uh, you know, rail lines that to take supporters. I mentioned 200 supporters showing up. In part, that was because they facilitated it with a special train that went from Muncie to, to Cincinnati. So um, there, there are signs that that existed. And I'm not sure about, you know, interurban versus major railroad companies. It was called the Big Five, I think was the name of the, the line, if that rings a bell to you. Um, I'd be happy to dig and see, you know, uh, see what I had that, um, that I might be able to share with you. But I, I wasn't focused on the structure of rail. But it's a good question in terms of sponsorship. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I didn't no, appreciate that. I, I was just kind of curious. It just might be another avenue to kind of look down as you continue the research. Just an yeah, idea. thank you very much for that. Great yeah. idea. Thanks. My dad is a big rail buff. So, you know, this is, uh, it, skipped a, it skipped a generation. My son was, you know, super into trains when he was young, but it skipped me. But it's interesting. Thank you. Can I comment on that too, very quickly? Patrick, that is a cool question. Uh, I don't know other than what. Craig said, but now that you got me thinking about it, some of the railroads would allow their hotels to be used as changing rooms for the team. And then they could go from there to the pitch. And I've never really put that connection together, uh, but some of those rail stations were terminus next to, to the soccer field. And then that's where the players would change into their gear and tramp over to the field. And kind of a cool little thought you just snapped. Yeah, good question. Huh. Any other comments, questions, last shots? We are uh, past the <laughs> hour mark here. Kevin. Can I ask a quick one just about St. Louis? Um, Craig, you mentioned very briefly there was no link to St. Louis and I found that really, really interesting as well. Um, it just reinforces this idea about St. Louis as an island um, which is, which is, is, is so interesting. It, it's obviously its own, its own universe for so many years, but I was curious there, there was, so could you build on that a little bit? There was literally no links that you could see. I mean, I know that there from time to time in Gabe's work and I've read it elsewhere that, you know, in newspapers that there were sometimes games or, a, you know, a, a one-off type of thing, but there were no more links of any kind. I think um, I, you know, I may have uh, misspoken or given you an impression that I didn't intend to, um, which is, you know, I can clarify right now. Uh, what I was saying about, I was speaking specifically about the Midwest Inner City League in 1929-1930. I didn't see any players who were recruited from St. Louis teams, which to me was very interesting because obviously if you're trying to build a strong team, you go where the strong players are. And many of them were in, were in St. Louis. Why they didn't do that, I don't. I don't know. Now that said, you know, the um, teams throughout the the region were. St. Louis was like the place you wanted to to compete. You wanted to beat a St. Louis team or Chicago team would be just as good. Um, you know, for the t cities outside there, and um, you know, Muncie, Indiana was talking about being in a league with with St. Louis, which obviously never happened. So it's not to say that there wasn't a link there, um, but I think distance was an issue too, in terms of, you know, a team from Cleveland going to play St. Louis. These things happen, you know, every once in a while, but um, they didn't manage to get anything regular. And I think a lot of it had to do with the strength of the leagues in St. Louis, frankly. Um, why would they want to trade halfway across the country when they could, you know, frankly, you know, support themselves with local, you know, local competition. So that's my, that's my idea at least, but I can't, I can't say, you know, I didn't specialize in looking at St. Louis stuff. I looked at a few things, um, but. Thank, thanks, sorry. I definitely then, I extrapolated that outside of here. <laughs> St. Louis as an island, that was an interesting, uh, you know, uh, comment. Uh, any other parting shots here? Uh, I know it's lunchtime for many of you. Um, we really thank you for joining. There's some really good stuff going on in, in the chat. 
uh, some, some good information uh, being passed. Please continue that uh, via email. If you need anybody's email or contact information, you can uh, reach out to myself or, or Ed Farnsworth, who has uh, the membership list. We are at an all time high, um, at least of uh, SASH 2.0 of membership. We were uh, just shy of 70 paid members. So uh, if you wanna uh, push that up over 70 and you're not a member and on this call, please uh, consider uh, doing that. Really enjoyed uh, Craig's uh, presentation today. Uh, look forward to his ongoing research and uh, I'll make a plea, post anything uh, on our website uh, you know, along the way to get feedback and anyone else out there who's, who's looking uh, to get some of their work out in the world, uh, please consider uh, the, the website. Uh, we'll uh, join uh, again uh, next month. Uh, we have a topic uh, on women's uh, soccer history, uh, then uh, moving closer to uh, the Men's World Cup in Qatar 2022, we'll have uh, an event on 1994, and we're still looking to schedule uh, one for December. Uh, we'll have a committee call uh, this weekend uh, to talk about everything that went on over uh, the spring and into the summer and plan for the rest of the year. So thanks to all. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, and in, uh, and enjoy and, and thank thank you, Craig. We really appreciate you coming and sharing your work with us. Thank you. Appreciate it a lot.